Well, I'm so, you, so happy and honored to be here uh, with Dana. I, you know, um, the one thing that I found reliably about her work is that if I start to doubt uh, the validity or the power of a novel, I just grab any one of Dana's and read it. And what, what happens to me always is first I, I realize that the book is doing something other novels haven't done before. And then second of all, it kind of reminds me that the, that expansion uh, has, a, has a moral corollary. There's a reason she's doing it and it's to, uh, to speak more directly to, you know, to us emotionally. So that's a huge gift, and I thank you for it. It happened just thank last you. week. I reread this book uh, after the end of the semester, and I felt so many things. Uh, um, it just made, made me happy, and it made me kind of uh, a, new, a new believer in art again. So thank you so much for that. Um, OK, so yeah. So I'm assuming we have a lot of writers in the house, probably everyone. You know, <laughs> but so I, I, I'm going to uh, maybe uh, err in the direction of the technical a little bit. But, okay. okay, and some of our students are here, so. Yes, yes. So font size. OK, no. <laughs> no. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to think a little bit about the way the writer you know, uh, moves from one project to the next. So Stone Arabia was an amazing accomplishment. Walk me through how this book sort of first arrived on your artistic horizon and how you, how you recognize it as a, as a thing? Well, I, um, it's weird to think about the origins, right? Because I think they're, they're, you start to tell a story to yourself about where you started and, um, and it sort of starts in a bunch of different places. But I had this, the opening of the book, um, the character Meadow is speaking in this essay and um, uh, I had that voice and that story, that, that the language of, that she uses in that. And, um, and that, I wrote that part early, and then I kind of played with that for a long time. And originally I thought she was going to be the one who called men, which as I was writing I realized that would be a, another person. But I had this idea that it was going to be a novel about confidence artists. Because I was, I was uh, watching a lot of Orson Welles film, and I watched uh, Epis for Fake, which is this documentary about uh, con artists, and he was kind of talking about you know being an artist as being a kind of a confidence game, and I had that idea, right. and and of course as I was writing that idea expanded in a lot of different ways and it became very different, um, but yeah, and and the idea of uh, there's another character who's a, uh, a kind of a pre-internet catfisher, and she's another kind of a confidence artist, and so I was very interested in this idea of you know presenting sort of being a really good liar because you feel that you have an, an eye on the higher truth, which is you know, essentially making fiction is somewhat like that. So I was trying to think about those ideas. So sometimes I have ideas, but a lot of times I just have questions. And, uh, and then I also just had, um, uh, and so, so yeah, so that's what it came. And I also do this thing, which maybe you do too, where I think I'm gonna do something totally different than I've done before. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna be anything like Stone Arabia, right. you know? Yes. And then, um, and you resist your tendencies, and then you sort of end up in a different version of your tendencies, right. which but, is okay. But is it the case that you said, you know, you'd written the first section of Meadow, and in a sense, she's, did you write that knowing she was inventing it? No, I was writing, I discovered that I was going along, I was like, oh, she's kind of lying, yeah. you know? So, like, so at that point, do, do, is it the case that then confidence artists as a motif gets in your mind and you start yes. noticing them, or do yes. you go seeking? No, then I started thinking about, um, I also had, had uh, read about this woman uh, Miranda, who was a, uh, um, had called men in Hollywood in the 80s, and I'd always thought about her, and there was a lot of catfishing going on at the time. So I, st I started writing this, not thinking about that, and then connected those two things. So yeah, so it's a combination of sort of what the book is giving you, and then what you start mm -hmm. noticing. And you become like this machine of noticing for your purposes, right? right. So you, you suddenly, the whole world is talking about what you're interested yeah. in. <laughs> it's a form of insanity, right, that kind right. of schizophrenia, where you start to notice but it's really you just looking for these things, oh, right? Okay. And, right? And you find it everywhere. Right. And it sort of seems like, I better write this fast because everybody's thinking about this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this might be a, a related question, but the, the other thing that I was amazed by, and maybe the first time it was sort of a straight emotional punch. The second time through, I was noticing how much that was related to the structure that you came up with. This kind of, I, I thought it was like a braiding kind of a structure, mm -hmm. two stories uh, that are apart for 179 pages, right. but the, and I know this is hard to talk about, but can you talk about the way that you develop these structural shapes? Is it, is it something where you sit down at the beginning and organize it out? Does it reveal itself to you, a little of both? I definitely write blind for a long time. The shape does not become apparent until I've written quite a bit, but I'm always trying to think that I know what the shape's gonna be. So I'm constantly taking notes. I have a notebook and I read, um, my method of writing 
uh, which I think you know, <laughs> is that I go back to the beginning and I read what I've written before I add more, when I finish a scene. Um, and when I do that, I add scenes. So I am, my process is revision and composition combined. Mm -hmm. So I've worked on it over and over again. So I can have it all in my mind as I go forward and you get those deeper connections and you get ideas as you're writing um, and you start to notice things in your own work right. that you then bring forward. Um, so, so the structure kind of comes out of that reading over what I have and sort of seeing things. And then once the shape starts getting a, you know, a possible shape, then um, I start doing more uh, uh, sort of visual representations of what I thought it would be like. So in this case, you have usually what you have in a thread novel is you have two different stories and then they, they meet and they kind of stay together. Right. And so in this one, I really had this idea that they would, that, that I kept thinking, push it farther, push it farther, push it farther. And although, and the way I write is I write um, the order you read it in. So I'll go from this storyline to this storyline to this storyline to this storyline. And so what you get from that is a kind of, um, uh, you get forward momentum because people want to find out what's going to happen, but you also get a kind of sideways momentum, yeah. this yes. weird push back and forth, as long as both of them are compelling. Um, but in this case, I knew that the idea was that, um, I think, the re what, what came to me was that it would be more like billiard balls, that they would connect and then go apart, right. that they wouldn't stay together, that they were only there to um, interfere with each other's lives right. in this one moment yeah. while they make the film together. Um, and that seemed, but I, I noticed because it's written that way, that you're, there's all sorts of connections between the two strands before they're narratively connected. It just happens exactly. because you're kind of moving back and forth between right. them. That, that's what struck me as so original is that, you know, sort of in a, in a simple dramatic form, you're just waiting for the intersection. Then you become aware that you're waiting for the intersection. You become aware that Dana is messing with you a little bit. But meanwhile, you're having so much pleasure and the stories are cross-talking yes, thematically yes. and stuff. Really, really. Happens. Which just happens. Right. Oh. In the process, oh. I think. That's wonderful. It was really right. amazing. Now, so I, one of the things that really moved me and made me incredibly jealous in this book was that there's this uh, tremendously wonderful artistic friendship that the two characters have when they're young. And that's the friendship I was always looking for all through my 20s <laughs> and 30s. Um, so could you read us uh, sure. a little bit? This is on page uh, 209 in that, that okay. vicinity. So this is, um, this is from a, an essay that Carrie, um, there's two two women in the books that are filmmakers. Carrie's a more commercial filmmaker, and she makes comedies, and she's very successful, and her, um, and Meadow is uh, her best friend, or was her best friend, and Meadow writes, uh, makes uh, these kind of um, more uh, edgy documentaries, I guess is how you put it. And so um, in this part of the book, she's looking back on when they first met, and how they became friends. And, and Carrie's just a much goofier, sort of um, self-deprecating person than Meadow. Um, let me just get a little sip of water. Yeah. <clears throat> I met Meadow at Wake School when we were both in eighth grade. When I saw her the first time, I thought she was older than I was. She wore stovepipe tight black jeans, black motorcycle boots, and a ribbed black turtleneck. She was slim and flat-chested, flat her brown hair cut in an asymmetrical bob, and she wore no makeup except dark red lipstick. She had a large, straight nose that gave her a defiant, anti-pretty edge. The look was a kind of 60s beatnik variation of punk, which was a tremendous amount of glamour for a 13-year-old. <laughs> At the time, I was still feathering my blonde hair and wearing badly applied blue eyeliner. I bought two tight jeans at Fred Siegel and had them altered to cut close to my ankles. We all did. But I was too chubby to look good in them and I wore oversized men's shirts to cover the bulge at my waist, which probably made me look even fatter. I was uncomfortable and awkward in my body and what impressed me most about Meadow was how confidently she inhabited herself. She glided into a room and every eye turned to her and she seemed unfazed by the attention. She fascinated me. I had one of those adolescent girl crushes on her, half admiration and half envy. <coughs> I would have admired her from afar for years, but I had the dumb luck to be assigned a seat next to her in Jay Hosney's ninth grade honors English class. The first, that first day, I was thrilled to see her up close in all her detail. She had ditched the black now and wore a white sleeveless shell shirt and white tailored capri pants tucked into flat-heeled ankle boots. She had applied a perfect cat eye with liquid liner and her lipstick was very pale. 
a sleek sex kitten, but modified by her muscled arms and her slightly butch attitude. I could not help sneaking glances to my left as she sat there. She smelled of cigarettes. She caught me staring and I started to giggle, which is what I did and still do when I'm nervous. What, Meta said, but with more weariness than irritation. I was laugh snorting, could barely speak. I caught my breath. Nothing, I said. I like your outfit. Yeah, she said. I'm really into retro slut, I said. And <laughs> barked out a dumb laugh. She rolled her eyes, but I could see she was laughing. You are, huh? Meadow looked me over in my oversized man shirt and my jeans so tight that when I bent my legs, the knees skin pinched into the folds of the fabric. <laughs> what look are you going for? <laughs> Fat and poor, I said. <laughs> She gave out, gave out a guffaw at that, a sound that betrayed her surface cool. We had that in common, loud, awkward, unladylike laughs. She smiled broadly and her wide mouth softened her hard edge. She was and is a seductive person. That day when class was over, she invited me to her place after school. Of course I said yes, Why would I, what would I miss, my TV and my slim fast? But first she suggested we ditch last period. We walked to Lucy's, the cheap taco stand behind the alley and ate greasy quesadillas wrapped in foil. We, started to we decided to walk over to the Santa Monica Pier to get coffees, and then I watched her roll and smoke a cigarette. I remember watching her smoke and knowing somehow that my adult life was beginning and she would be the key to it. We ate ice creams to get rid of the cigarette breath and, make it back and made it back to campus in time for her mother to pick us up in her big green Mercedes. The car had a burled wood and tan interior with a creamy leather smell, so different from my mother's old Honda Civic's reek of french fries and stale candy corn. Her house in Bel Air was extremely lavish compared to our little rented house in Santa Monica, but I was used to that. Everyone at Wake School had money except for me and a few other scholarship kids. Her wealth was merely typical in that world. But what did strike me was her collection of books and records. She was, it turned out, brilliant on top of stylish and beautiful. I have to admit that I thought for a second that it wasn't quite fair. Meadow had everything. But I stopped myself and just thought, she wants to be friends with me, which felt very good. We sat on the floor of her room and listened to Talking Heads 77, which I also owned. We all bought that record. In those days, whether it was jeans or music, the whole class acted in unison, the same records in every collection with a few variations. But here is where Meadow began to change me. Instead of watching TV, she, she suggested we make a movie. She had a Super 8 camera, an actual black and white film, which was rare. She wanted us to film each other in the canyon behind the house. And we did, first Meadow, Meadow directing me as I walked through the shrub and the rocks. You have lost something, she said, something important. I walked, looking. I imagined I was lost in the canyon, looking for a way out. Move over to your left where that stream of light is. I moved. Beautiful. Wow, she said. Just walk slowly and think of the saddest thing you can. I now imagine my dog, Sylvester, who had died the year before. Thinking of him could bring me to tears in seconds. Great, Meadow whispered. <laughs> and then I felt it. When things get intense, it always happened. I felt the genuine tears flood my eyes. And then I turned my body into a giant wet noodle and a huge forward pratfall, flipping over and letting the weight of my ass send me over again, exaggerating my tumble until I heard Meadow laughing. I heard the laugh and continued to tumble, adding cartoony sound effects as I rolled painfully over the rocks. I would do anything to get people to laugh at me, and tripping, falling at pretty much any moment never failed. Then it was my turn, and I was at a bit of a loss. I thought about what I wanted to see. I told her to nonchalantly walk up to the pool and drop in, fully clothed and with no expression on her face. Really, she said? That's what I got. I said, falls, unexpected falls. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Meadow laughed, but then she did the slowest and most serious deadpan walk to the edge of the pool. I filmed her, and she stood there in her white clothes, feet together, perched on the lip. She was very still and expressionless. Then she began to sway, gently at first, and then more widely, but still expressionless, until she keeled over like a felled tree into the water. I think that I love Meadow from that moment on. Hmm. So beautiful. So, so, I mean, not to be too, like, biopic, but did you have artist, artistic friendships that were that intense when you were young? Uh, I d you know, I did. I think more, um, not that young, more in yeah. college level, but it was that kind of moment, those, the t I, I was interested in sensibility and how you form your sensibility, and sometimes I think you are drawn to the people that um, have things that you want to know that know things that you don't know, and you sort of fall in love with them, and that's how you grow. I mean, at least that's how I did. Anybody and so I would, you know, I was very attracted to 
to stylish women who were really smart and knew things I didn't know. And I wanted to be friends with them, and I thought it would rub off on me. And you know what? It does rub off on me. <laughs> yeah, well, we, can, the, we can tell. Not the good looks. <laughs> yeah. Not the stylishness, but the, uh, but the sensibility, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. As, as you, I, I was wondering, I mean, when you were a young kid, uh, are there any particular moments that you can remember where if we saw them, we'd go, oh, yeah, that kid's definitely bound to be an artist? Any moments where, you know, at the time, of course, it seemed natural, but when you, but if we saw it, we'd go, yeah, that's a... Uh, no, I, I think I moved around a lot. So I was, I think, like a, many artists, I was kind of lonely, yeah. and I spent a lot of time reading and watching movies and, and listening to music. Mm. Um, and so I had a pretty active life of um, observation and, and fantasy rather than uh, living, mm. I would say. Um, so <laughs> maybe that was one, you know, I found a lot of solace in books. Right. And so I think that's made me want to be a writer. But the gap between wanting and being able to write was so, I was such a, I was not one of these kids that, that the teachers kept saying, you should be a writer, you're terrific. <laughs> not, not, that didn't happen, no. Well, it shame was in on my them, head, shame on them. Only in my head that, that, that it was occurring. Yeah. Well, yeah. This, this makes me think, you know, one of the, the in all of your books that I've read, I, I find myself thinking that the references, the cultural references must be invented because they come so naturally to serve the dramatic structure. Like sometimes when people are bad researchers, there's a sudden six chapter Right, diversion right. into child stars of the 40s or something, and right. then you go, what was that about? And no, they, they, must have, they must have read that, you know? But in yours, it's the opposite. I, and in this book, there were so many graceful, beautiful, appropriate uh, mentions of movies, and I would go, there, there can't be a movie like that. And I'd look it up, and sure enough, Daisies, for example, right, which Daisies, I didn't know. So I, I guess I want to just sort of pick your brain as to how does one uh, gather so much information right. such that when one needs it, one finds the perfect <laughs> thing, <laughs> you know? Well, the nice thing about writing books, as you know, is that um, you can create the impression that you know a lot more than you actually do, right? Because you just have to be, what's on the page has to work, and you create this idea of a person who's totally obsessed. So Meadow is more obsessed with films than even mm. I. I mean, I'm obsessed with films, but she's beyond what I am. But, um, and so you kind of, uh, but I am interested in, in, in what, I do kind of immerse myself in the world. Right. And, um, and I think I do it somewhat uh, to, get that, to get a density there, to get a kind of authority, to get confidence, and also because it's fun and it's easier than writing, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and so I do get obsessive and, and, and met the way that Meadow is obsessive, I, I, I do give her some of my obsessiveness. And I think you start out thinking, you start out with the stuff that you really love and then as you're creating the character you start thinking of what th this person would really love, and then you actually, as a person, get obsessed with it too right. in order for you to pull it off. So that's what happened, I think, with, uh, you know, with Eat the Document. I love the Beach Boys, so I had this character love the Beach Boys because that would be easy for me to do. Right. But then he, in the process of enacting his obsession, I became completely right. way more obsessed. Right. So it's a weird thing. And then you're kind of stuck with that obsession forever. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's well, yours I, now. I thought, that, well, you know, your books are so... Uh, it sounds strange to say, but they are so uplifting because the love for the culture is so strong, so emphatic. And sometimes I think, you know, there, those of us who are progressives might have a lot of reasons to not love the culture. Right. Uh, but in your work, that's there, but then the, this, this real serious enthusiasm for the things that our culture has made and done is, is there. And it, it's a really a beautiful, like, joy transfer machine. Oh, I, I, really, I really love it and appreciate it. Yeah, well, I mean, um, there's also the thing where you, you populate a book with real things and imaginary things. So in this book, there are imaginary films and real films. Right. And, uh, and you want them to be sort of inhabit. In the universe of the book, they both exist, right. Right? right? And so that's a weird thing when you really think about it, right? So in the universe of this book, uh, this, these actual films exist, but also these imaginary films. And so trying to think about that through is interesting. But it is, it, the idea is that you know, the reader will then sort of Usually the weirdest things are the real things, I guess is right. what I would say, right. Right? right? Like the things that seem totally made up are the actual things, right. yes. Did you ever make films yourself? Did you, ever, did you I did. I made my, my senior project. At, I went to a high school like the one in the book, and my senior project was a film that I made with a friend. Is it in the book, that film? No. no. Could, it's, could you no. enlighten us as to its contents no. at this time? <laughs> if the crowd demands it? No, okay. Everybody don't, yeah. Just say yeah. I'm not yeah. a filmmaker. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. All right. Um, at one point, uh, Meadow thinks of one of her projects uh, the idea never went anywhere unexpected, so yeah. she so she doesn't like it. Um, 
uh, this reminds me of that Donald Barthelme essay on not knowing which, you know, the, the artist is the person who embarking on her task has no idea what to do. Right. Well, where did this book, so in terms of your idea of what the book was going to be, right. you started out and you're very happy with that. Where did it go uh, unexpectedly that then made you happy? Okay, so as I was writing it um, and taking notes and thinking about it, I started to think about, and I think actually I was, I was actually had, was talking to Nan, my editor, about this too, where I was just had this idea that that Meadow um, was, that she had this idea about herself and she had these film directedness that she wanted to make and I liked that she was so hard and that she was so um, uh, monolithic, but then uh, I thought she would um, sort of have these unintended consequences and, and she would have to change. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I was really interested in this idea. I had this little picture of um, uh, Saul on the Road to Damascus, the Caravaggio, where he falls off the horse, the famous painting where he's like, and I was thinking, does that really happen? Can that really happen? Could you make that happen? Like, what would happen to Meadow to change her? What could happen to her? And I think I said to Nan, you know what? So I was reading the Sheila Hetty book, how, how, how Should a Person Be? And I was thinking, maybe my book is how, sh how, sh how Can a Person Be Good? And so I was thinking, like, what could make Meadow change? And can I make that work? Uh, what could happen to her that she would have this clarity? And I think I'm really interested in this idea where you realize that your life is not the, you're leading the, the not the life that you thought you were leading, mm -hmm. that you're not the person you thought you were, that maybe you've done some not so great things or that you, that you could have done better. Right. And then I think the question is, and we all have those moments, but what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I'm not so interested in, in bad people, but I am interested in, in this kind of human moment where you realize that you've, you've messed up yeah. and you've hurt people and what you do with that. And, and that seemed like a very um, challenging thing mm -hmm. because it's emotional and it's kind of earnest, you know? Um, but, I, but I was really convinced that that's where the book was going. Yeah. I could feel her coming in for a fall. Right. And um, and so that's that's but at that point did you know that the fall would involve Jelly or so Jelly exist uh, yeah, at that point? Yeah, yeah, I mean yeah. I knew that she was going to make a film about Jelly and expose her, and then I thought, well, what are the consequences of that? Mm -hmm. You know, because I had this idea that we would see uh, one of her subjects outside. We weren't the book wasn't going to treat Jelly the way Meadow does, right? Mm -hmm. Meadow just kind of like powers in, makes a movie about her, and you know moves on to the next film. But the book we would see Jelly all the way up. And then we'd see Jelly after, so we'd know like the consequences. Yeah. But I wanted, I realized I want Meadow to know the consequences. So then Jelly confronts uh, Meadow. But a bunch of other things, I realized also that people don't have these road to Damascus moments. They have a series of moments. So she has a series of moments. Right. So you know, you 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 see when you're ready to see. Right. And can, if maybe you want to change. Can you so, read us that moment? I think it's is this the 187 moment. Is that is that right? Am I right about this? There, it just this uh, these. Well, that's one of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a beautiful. Uh, okay. Because the book to me was so much about selfishness and self involvement in the way that you try to get clear of that, in order that you can live with yourself, which is another form of selfishness, and, and on and on. And I thought in this moment you really showed the way it's possible to kind of get outside of that. Okay, so the the part where she's going to see Carrie's movie. Yes. Okay. Uh, one afternoon, she slipped off to Union Square. She walked to the Village East Cinema by herself, and she bought a ticket to see Girl School, Carrie's feature film. It had been out for weeks, and Meadow hadn't seen it yet. She was catching the second show of the day on a Monday. Only a few people were in the audience, but she gathered that the film was doing very well. The funniest film of the summer was what the Times said, or at least that was what was quoted on the poster outside. She wasn't in the right state of mind to see Carrie's light comedy. She could feel her resistance, and she could see the setup for each joke, each pratfall coming before it happened. It was, on its own terms, well done. Its ambition to make a raunchy school comedy about women was fully realized. Meadow couldn't wait until it finished, and she slipped out before the end. She walked down the street and came to a stop. She turned back towards the theater. What was wrong with her? Why was she like this so ungenerous? On a different day, or maybe a different time in her life, she would have laughed and gotten lost in the fun of Carrie's film. Carrie's perfect, playful comedy. Meadow stood there unmoving and lifted her glasses to wipe her eyes, her stingy tears. What kind of person has she become and why couldn't she be better? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, you know, yeah. that's before that's she like gets the, the jelly. Hint. That's yeah. the first yeah. hint that yeah. she's, she has a, uh, her life starts to fall right. apart. It made me think of the way that fiction uh, hits us is, you know, you're, you're sort of attracting a character and you're almost waiting for the character to do something that you wouldn't do and thereby alienate you. And in that one, it was so perfect because I thought, yeah, I would probably have that little bit of a snotty reaction to the film. Right. 
And then I would come outside and go, why did you have that snotty reaction to the <laughs> film? You know, and that whole human being is contained in, in that. And, so, and so also, like, I think that you have that moment where even when you recognize that you're doing something that's not generous, mm -hmm. it doesn't always mean that you can stop feeling that way. Right. And that's right. a kind of tragic feeling that's that right. you're, that, you know, I think Meadow at some point says in the book, she goes, I don't mind that I'm a bad person. I would hate not to know. <laughs> but she actually does mind, right? right. Like, right. but it doesn't mean that she can change her that's right. what she's doing. Yeah, because she's in. There's a tension within her. I think right. like most characters have tensions within them, right. and so the part of her that wants to do the thing that she wants to do, um, is in tension with the part of her yeah. that that is less, you know, that wants to be maybe learn to be more compassionate. Right. Yeah. Beautiful, really beautiful. Now, let me just go back a little bit. When you were uh, a, a young writer, did you have a failed book? Mm. Mm. Please say yes. Um, <laughs> I had a lot of failed stories, uh -huh. you know, yeah. uh, and, but then, you know, I, I think the key for me was that I wasn't really much of a short story writer, mm -hmm. that I really was, that when I started working on Lightning Field, it was a kind of, um, I, had, I had a writing teacher and I was having, really frustrated for a number of years about where I was going, and then I just thought, I'm just going to do this secret thing where I write this book and I'm going to write the, what I want to write, and it's not going to be what, I'm not going to show it to anybody. Yeah. And I started writing Lightning Field, and that was my little secret that I would go back to. And I really did have no idea whether it was going to be good. I remember just thinking that it's, it, it, was, it was not the book I wanted to be writing, yeah. that it seemed, um, I wanted something with more gravitas or something. But it was very, um, but it was, it, I kept doing it, hmm. right? And, uh, and I didn't, no one saw any of it until it was done. Yeah. So the answer is you didn't have a failed. No, I had many. No, no it's, it's fine. Many it's fine. Failed. No, it's fine. It's many fine. Failed. Some people don't. It happens. But not well, we're out of time. <laughs> out of time. <laughs> many failed short yeah, yeah, stories. Yeah. All right. Okay. Whatever. And some failed screenplays. Yes. Or... Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> no, no. Um, now, one of the things that that I thought was really wonderful in this book, and and a little bit Pomo, was that the. Uh, the characters are always thinking of ideas for films and, and imagining things they might make. Uh, Turns how out it's easier to write films and books than to actually make films in real life. Well, I, I, I had a feeling that there must be film students out there going, yeah, we'll, we'll make that one. <laughs> but how, can you talk us through, how do you, um, let's say you, you know that Meadow's about to have an idea for a film. Right. How do you, well, maybe we can read an example first, and okay. you can tell me how you did it. So this is like page 71, 74. Can you read? Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll do one more reading if you don't mind. So Meadow has uh, just gone up to uh, upstate New York where she, um, she's about 20 and she's abandoned going to film school and she's doing her own self-taught thing, right? And Carrie's come and visited her to see what she's up to. Carrie's at NYU going to film school. Uh, Meadow showed Carrie the train movies even though Meadow knew Carrie wouldn't appreciate what had gone into them. All spring, Meadow had risen at five every day, not for any practical reason, but for the feeling of immersion. She needed to feel the pain of her devotion. She drove the old Subaru down to Route 5S, which runs parallel to the Mohawk River. She knew it was a horse trail once, the one narrow pass between the mountain ranges if you needed to go west, and of course everyone always needed to go west. First the Erie Canal paralleled the Mohawk, then the railroad, then I-90. Meadow loved how each thing remained, even as it was surpassed by new technology. The river, the canal, the railroad, and the interstate lay right next to one another like a graphic depicting two centuries of progress. But her attention was drawn to the freight trains. Their approach and passing were infinitely more beguiling than the semi-trucks that monotonously thundered down I-90. Meadow discovered that she could get to the tracks in a number of unprotected places in between stations. Sometimes she had to climb over a fence. At first she brought her late, lightweight Super 8 camera, but later she used her video camcorder. Other times she set up her expensive 16 millimeter camera and made Deke come to record sound. Oh, the sound of a train. The first rhythmic sounds of the approach, the wheels of the train clicking fast against the tracks, the way the rhythm gathered and the volume increased as the train grew closer. It created a train approaching, that is, its own suspense. Not suspense exactly, momentum that intensified and created a need for satisfaction. And then, just as she anticipated, the sound built to a roar. The train went by in a huge rush, the clamor as it rattled the switch track, the whistle announcing its passing if it approached a station, the beeping alarm of the crossing signal if it cut through a road. 
The passing was a satisfying rush. You were in it, the longed-for moment, the powerful mechanical thing speeding by and dwarfing you. It overwhelmed you, but even in the midst of it, you knew it would be over soon. The noise, the movement, the friction of metal on metal, it will all pass you by. Meadow filmed the trains by lying in the cold, wet mud and pointing the camera right at the point of contact of wheels on tracks. She also filmed pointing the camera up at the train from the same vantage. She filmed them from far away, like a train passing in an old country song. She boarded the passenger train in the tiny station in Amsterdam and rode it one stop to Schenectady, then boarded a westbound train back to Amsterdam. She spent the short rides kneeling in the joint between two cars. She struck her, stuck her camera close to the gap where she could see and hear the tracks as the train rushed over them. She saw a blur where the ties would be, and the camera lurched when the train lurched. She practiced keeping the camera steady. Then she held her body loosely and let the camera lurch with the train, the mechanical solidity and simplicity, the weight of the train on the track, the power of the constant friction, all of this she wanted to find a way to put in a film, and the longing of the train, the Saturday reproach of a train whistle in the distance that seemed to say, why are you here and not a train? <laughs> Going, gone on a train. Meadows sent her film to a lab in New York City on 44th Street she collected the reels and watched them on the editing console in the studio she had set up in the warehouse. She marked the film with wax pencil. She had two minute or eight minute segments clipped to a wire hanging around her. She tried it, it synced and then she varied the volume so the sound dropped in precise places. Then she abandoned the sound she'd recorded altogether. Variables, so many of them they overwhelmed her. Other times the possibilities excited her so much she got up in the middle of the night to work or take notes. Meadow tried to add some of the Britain music to her films. Then she tried something more repetitive and tense, Steve Reich, or something lush and melodic, Gershwin. Music can invisibly amplify, or music can be an ironic counterpoint to the images. Music can seduce or make you feel slightly off, uncomfortable. She always thought that a pushy film score was cheating, but she realized maybe she just wanted to eliminate variables to make things simpler. She was simple, plain, she knew nothing. She needed to see movies. How do they use music, sound effects, silence? There's true silence, which feels like negative sound. It almost sucks you out. And then there's movie silence with ambient sounds like breathing and chair scraping. She paired her train images with music bright and nostalgic. Then just the sound of the river, which seemed so pastoral and almost invisible next to the train, but now suddenly had a fighting chance for her attention. She then filmed the outmoded, obsolete, obscure Mohawk River, the train in deep background. She filmed just the river, untrained or pre-trained. She cut these together, the river disturbed and obliterated by the train in a logical sequence, in a sequence of no logical chronology. The left and right expectations resisted. You lose logic, you lose legibility. It unnerves. Yes. She shot the untrained, unmanned world, birds, river, the wind on the leaves, the river roar made faint by the train roar. But then it returns after the train passes. If she took away the sound and let the train pass in the background without its steady clack, 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 it still found its rhythm in your head. You supplied the clack, clack, clack from a hundred other movie or real life trains. You could do that, play on the sounds already in people's heads, the memory of trains. But not even that, the memory of trains seen in movies. Was it fair or good or right to count on, even consider an assumption of memory? But isn't that what all film counted on, a kind of shared memory of everything we have seen in the movies? So beautiful. Thank you. That, that just reminds me of how wonderful, it, and you know, hear language like that, that's that beautiful and that um, joyful. It's just, it's just like a direct transfer of happiness. Oh. Kind of thing. But can, so when you were, I mean, not to take everything apart technically, but okay, now enough of that emotion. How'd you do it? How'd you do it? you. I will tell you that I did um, go ride the train from Schenectady, and I did take films of, I mean, oh. I, did, I do have a kind of, um, method actory thing that I do. When I was writing the, the stuff for uh, Jelly, I, was, I went to the Center for the Blind and I hung out there a long time mm. and I walked around my house and I put dots on things and I, oh, you so know, I do it all, yeah. I do it. It's fun, and, but also you notice things um, that you wouldn't notice if you, for me, maybe I'm just simple. I'm like Meadow, I'm simple. And um, I just need to actually feel it on my body. Right. But I'm always looking for the body connection to the thing I'm writing about. Right. And sometimes just getting out there and doing it is the way to do it. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I like the idea that she's so extreme. Mm -hmm. And I think people, when they are extreme, they kind of find um, unusual, un, unnoticed things. Like they, they find something that you wouldn't notice from a casual look. Right. So that deep looking is interesting to me. And then being very precise about that. 
um, maybe two percent. I mean, I just can't stop myself when I'm going. No, but you, that, it's so funny because <laughs> reading that account of that young woman artist, it reminds me so much of myself as a 15-year-old. And if you could have decoded my big plans, you know that right. kind of. And it's so beautifully present in her voice and her enthusiasm. It's well, really she starts out with a lot of self-interrogation about her work, and I wanted to give her that. I wanted her to fail, and I wanted her to know she was failing, and to be very rigorous. And then it was sort of surprising that she could be so rigorous about her interrogation of her own aesthetic ideas, but then not about her own person, her, right. not rigorous about interrogating just what effect she's having on other people. Right. So it's, I think it's that idea that you, could, you can try to be rigorous and you can still deceive yourself, that self-deception. Is uh, is horrifying yeah. to me, you know, yeah. like that. That that's a, that's my own fear, right? right? I, and so, yeah, I found to find myself in that place with her because she seems so full of rigor and so like ruthless about her, even her own failure. You think that she couldn't be in this lost place? Right. I also love the way that the two artists, uh, you know, Carrie is sort of. Uh, happy to be in the game and uh, and isn't so much about innovation. She wants to take the thing one step further kind of joyfully and she succeeds wildly. Yeah. And then Meadow's a little more, I suppose, the part of us that says, uh, if it's fun, it must suck. Right. And that attitude kind of brings her down a little bit. So it's a beautiful kind of commentary on what, what art actually is. Speaking of which, I want to broaden a little bit. And we, we did uh, just have an election. It turns we out, did. yeah, yeah. I don't know how. I don't know the results. How did yet, it turn out? I, well, I, we're waiting to hear. Um, but, um, but do you, I mean, I don't know. Did you feel? I mean, when something like what just happened happened, does it affect your essential artistic self? Do you feel discouraged, energized? Uh, any change in methodology? Any new commitment or anything like that? Well, you know, um, I think we all felt a lot of despair uh, and shock after the election. And part of you does want to just kind of crawl into a hole and, and not think about it. Um, but of course, you know, I, we were talking earlier about the stuff that we were reading, and, and reading has been very helpful, um, not just fiction, but reading writers that you admire. I was reading this essay um, by Camus about, you know, uh, creating dangerously, writing dangerously, creating dangerously, I think it's called. And uh, he was talking a lot about this idea that, that you know, there's a kind of consent that happens if you, if you don't speak out, if you don't engage. And so I think, you know, being, a, being active and being on the ramparts and doing all that and also working and not, not you know, we need this kind of connection. We need to right. find, and also we were, I think this idea that we have, um, the culture feels very reductive and very black and white right now and very polarized. And I think fiction is a place where things have a lot more complexity. And that feels countercultural to me. And it's, I always feel that it feels subversive and it feels um, rebellious in a way um, because it feels very counter to the way things are. Right. And, and so I think it's important to, have, to write towards lucidity and to write towards clarity about how things are and, and not kind of like buy into the noise of the culture. Right. I mean, yeah. just for our own sanity. Yeah. But then yeah. you still have to go out and, and fight. I right. Think, yeah, you know? kind of, I, and reading your book was such a, uh, a nice kind of... Um, Denial of that binary thinking because I've been like anybody else. I've just been living on the internet and right. having big arguments in my head that it were feels a little kind of simple. poisonous at a certain point. Yeah. Oh yeah, and, and there's no—it's a cul-de-sac. There's no way out. But then you get into a beautiful work of fiction and you see that everything is multiple. People are multiples. You know, um, ways of thinking are multiple, and it just felt sort of freeing in a little way. A little, get a little bit of room to breathe. Yeah, and yeah. there's other writers who have written about tyrants in the past. Right. You know, That's and you can go back and and sort of. Talk about that, you know, silence is consent. Right. You, know, right. you can't, art for art's sake is not a, a possibility at this right. point. You right. have to be engaged. You can't give up. Right. Um, and it's good to, to, to know that that's the case. Right. I mean, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. Yeah. Now, at this, at, this, at this point in your artistic trajectory, are you, um, this is kind of a weird question, but what, what, um, what remains? So in, in terms of like, are you, when you turn your mind to the next book, is there some satisfaction you haven't gained yet, or is there, there are questions you're still asking? What what kind of drives you to keep to keep creating? Um, for me, it's more of just not. Um, you just get these something you you try to push something away. Something fascinates you. I had a, a writer friend tell me that you know pay attention to what fascinates you, mm. and so I think you try to push something away and say I don't want to. I don't want to spend four years with that. You know what I mean? Like it's like getting married. You just push it away. <laughs> the four-year four marriage. That, yeah, that, yeah. Four <laughs> um, and if it keeps coming back to you and you can't stop thinking mm -hmm. about it, you know, 
and uh, then it's probably there's something there that you're trying to figure out. Right. You know, something that's compelling. I remember with Eat the Document, I was reading uh, People magazine in my shrink's office, and I read about um, <laughs> Catherine Ann Power, and she turned herself in after 20 years. And I just remember, first of all, I stole the magazine. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're allowed to do it, right? You are. And I took it home, and I couldn't stop thinking about her because I kept thinking, why would you turn yourself in after 20 years? Like, you got away with it. Like, what? She woke up one day, and she's like, I'm, I'm going to the mm. police station. And I couldn't figure it out. So then I thought, well, I'll write about it. I'll figure it out. So I was, realized I wasn't interested in what she did, but, but those 20 years that led up to that moment. Like, right. how you could. Right. So sometimes when you can't answer a question, you, that's a, that's a, a place of energy, right. I think, that's right. right to discover right. for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and why 20 years and not 25 or 18? Yeah, like yeah. what happened yeah. that day? Yeah. And right. so your imagination just starts to, and you have that moment where you, where you read about somebody in the news, and I think I get a lot of inspiration from reading mm -hmm. stories about people, and I just, I can't stop thinking about them yeah. and what it must be like to be them. Right. And that is, a, you know, an energetic for me. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we, as you may know, we teach together at Syracuse University, uh, which is in Syracuse, New York. Yeah, this is an infomercial. Um, but, so high of 17 tomorrow. Uh, uh, that, that undercuts my sales pitch. Hold on. Uh, but, but can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> That's 17. Beautiful in the fall, in yeah, the summer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you, uh, how does the teaching affect your writing life and vice versa? Mm. I mean, it's kind of a standard question. Well, you kind of got me into this. You know? I, yes, so I, I, I went to interview at Syracuse, and I asked you this question, and you <laughs> told me that it would be okay. And, and you were right. Okay. You were right. All right. Um, uh, it's it's very inspiring, actually, because the students keep you on your toes, and you get to at Syracuse. We get to read a lot of great books. We teach these forms classes with really smart people, and it's so great to have those conversations. And there are those moments where you think, I can't believe I'm getting paid to talk yeah. about these books with these incredibly smart people. Um, other times you feel like you earn the money, but it's uh, no, it, it, it's very uh, it's very gratifying to be around young people who care so much yeah. about writing and are so into it, and it inspires you, and it, it reminds you of what and you and being forced, I think, to say why you think something's beautiful or why you think something is important, and be really precise about it, or why you think something's a problem. Uh, it gives you more rigor. Yes. And, I, and you know, you compartmentalize your life as a writer. You have to, right? right? So I find when I go and do my own work, I don't, you block all that out. Right. Right. You're just doing your thing. But I think it, it, but it, it, I think it gives you skills, yeah. don't you think? Oh, yeah. And I can say we're so lucky to have you, and we're so grateful. It's oh my incredible. God. Yeah. But you're yeah. such an incredible teacher that everybody, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you right. are. Nah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, right. and, and, and. Oh, you are. No, you but, but are. <laughs> but Syracuse is a place, this is a little pitch for Syracuse, but it's true. It is the place where the, the, the culture is that the people who teach there, they publish, they write, and they really care about teaching. And so there's nobody there who's like, I'm trying to do as little teaching as possible. I hate this. I'm, it's beneath me. Everybody is always, the students really matter. Teaching is really important. You're that way. Mary's that way. Everybody's that way. And so the, the culture is much healthier, I think. It's better for the students. It's better for you. Because you shouldn't do something you don't love. Right. Right, it's not good for you. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And we also, we you know, we get 650 applications for six spots, so, so we have they're already students. off the charts. Yeah. 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 No, and it's it, it's quite it is a community, and I never had that before because I didn't go to an MFA program. Mm -hmm. I never had a writing, and I like having it's it's it is good when you guys are all so productive. I, I feel ashamed, and I have to go home and work. All right, that's <laughs> yeah. that's what we're there for. <laughs> all right, so I think now we, we uh, have some time for questions from from you, for Dana, if you if you have any, we're happy to have them. No state capitals, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't be shy. I always it's say that these, in these gatherings are so tense. And so it's always weirdly like the, the, the person who asked the first question always turns out they have the highest sexual energy in the room. <laughs> <laughs> it's this weird, like, Darwinian. Yeah, I thought, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are you reading anything right now? Like, what are you reading right now, fiction-wise? Oh, what am I reading right now? Fiction-wise, uh, actually, I'm reading nonfiction. I'm reading that those essays by Camus. That's what I'm reading. Yeah. I'm not reading any fiction right now. Yeah. What about you? Uh, I just read Swing Time by Zadie Smith, which I loved. Uh, and what else? And I'm reading Ann Patrick's new novel. I kind of I've been doing a bunch of research, and now I'm back into fiction land. So that's really good. Yeah. Second most sexually active. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, yes, it's all sitting in one area. Interesting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, you talked about the you know, day and what's next in your artistic trajectory. Do you mean you guys have trajectories? You don't just write a book and then wonder how you're ever going to ever write again? I think that's the trajectory. I think that, that <laughs> that's <laughs> the trajectory, yeah. Do you, do you think, I mean, do you? I think it's, I, for me, I think it's healthy to just think, like, when you're done, well, maybe I'll never do that again, mm. you know? Yeah. I mean, you have to have some kind of urgency to it and have an idea. I don't think it's sort of. You know, yeah. it's not a given that that it'll ever. I don't know. It seems kind of like a miracle they ever get one done. Yeah. And I feel very alienated from books I've written. I just, just think like, oh, my feeling. This is kind of stupid. I think like, I don't. I think I was smarter then. I don't think I can do that again. That's just so so much hard work. Like I'm kind of late, and I'm just like, oh, I can't do it. And then all of a sudden you get obsessed and you're back in it. Right. But um, but it, I sometimes I look at my books and I'm like, who wrote that? I don't. You yeah. know, that seems like a lot of work. It's a lot of work. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's I'm, yeah. yeah. But you're think, always you always have something going. So yeah, I have well, gaps. I, yeah. I have gaps. Yeah. yeah. I, I kind of feel like I, I want to not be. Um, I, I want to write a book that's as gen, as happy and not happy, but sort of as, yeah, basically happy as I am. That would be nice. And I have and my technical skills have stopped me from doing that so far. So I, I'd like to keep uh, trying to write books that are more expansive. But there's a technical ceiling for me, and I'm trying to like push that up huh. just before I die. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Say that last part again. Like, at what point, if at all, do you feel like you have to let go and let these characters become their own? Like, oh yeah, I mean they're never they're never me. What happens is um, that when I'm writing a character that's very dislocated from me, sometimes I give them thing parts of me. Does that make sense? Like an experience or something? Mm -hmm. um, and I think I would if they were if they were so they're already far from me and that's what enables me to put my own experiences in there. Sometimes it, it, I think for me fiction is, uh, uh, I usually, I write to kind of escape my own identity, to escape myself. I like being in somebody else. Um, but then you're thinking, you, you just, it just comes out something, some observation or some feeling or something that seems to fit the moment. And I think that is a little bit like method acting, right? Like you take an emotional reality and you put it in where it's appropriate. And it just sort of happens naturally. So there's lots of stuff that people that I recognize, and, but it's so dislocated from me that it that doesn't really belong to me. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One more question? Any more? Anybody else? OK. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, these days, I don't get much. Uh, at the very end, I give it to my wife. And she knows me after 30 years. So she'll kind of say, your ending's full of shit. And I'll, say, and I'll say, oh, honey, I don't know why I even give this to you anymore. You know, and then I kind of go off and think about it. And about day two or three, I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. You know, and so, so that's one. And then um, if I'm publishing The New Yorker, Deborah Treisman is a great reader. And then uh, I have my good friends at ICM to keep me honest. And, but, but I try to keep it to myself as long as I can. And work mm -hmm. through the easy, you know, the easy, and then the less easy stuff, so that when you're, uh, when you send it out, even to your wife, it's kind of a commitment. Like I've investigated all the, the cul-de-sacs, and I've kind of ruled out the easy things. This is as far as I can get it right now. Now will you weigh in? Sort of like that. Yeah, yeah I would say it's similar. I um, definitely have some trusted readers, and my editor, and. Um, that I listen very carefully to what they say, but it's you, it's a complete object that then do some revisions based on some of their, especially if it lines up with my own concerns about something. Um, and so there's that, and then there's just, um, so there's lots of tinkering and altering and, and that sort of thing, but, it, but it's usually not midway through or mm -hmm. anything like that. But you definitely need somebody who can read it, who you really trust, who's smart, like your editor. Um, who can tell you, you know, where you've lost them and yeah. where you've failed and 
all that and adjust. So, um, but yeah, I think it kind of needs to be a, a whole object before you do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's funny because you know we have the three-year uh, fiction program where they're in workshop all the time, and it's always interesting at the end to say, okay, now blessing, you don't have to take any more workshops. You can just go out and decide for yourself. You know, that, I think that three-year period of taking workshop is kind of important, but then after that, it's maybe best to just retreat and you know. Yeah, and I also think that that it's that a novel is kind of you have to be kind of mesmerized by it for a while, mm -hmm. and it, and it maybe keeping it private is a way of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. hypnotizing yourself into working on it, and it's sort of this you don't want a, a lot of outside commentary right. until you know what it is, and then you want the commentary, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. which is terrifying, right? I mean, you were terrified when you were working on your novel, right? Because it was still, usually still when am. <laughs> but when you're, but when you're publishing short stories, you're pu they've all have been out in the world. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. And this thing is now. Yeah, it's yeah. just come out all at once like a big baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's very, yes. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions we can help you with? Right. Thank well, you. Well, I want to thank the Center for Fiction for yeah, all that they do, and thank you very much. And Dana, thank you so much. Thank you.